everybody, I'm Miss Jessica from EVPL Oakland, and today we're here for our chapter book story time variety pack. Now, when I have been doing our chapter book story time, we have been spinning a wheel to find out what we're going to read the next time we are together, and we landed on historical fiction, which means that it is a story that is set in a time period in the past. And the book that I have chosen for today, it has been on lots of recommended reading lists, lots of best uh, books of the year lists. Um, it's something that I have seen lots and lots of different places and it's definitely been on my to read list. And it is called Front Desk by Kelly Yang. Now this book definitely is um, great at the illustrations on the cover and it really, really helps to set the scene of what we're going to be reading about. And we do have Harper with us today. She's kind of right down here. Oh, here she comes. Hello, Harper. Okay, so let's see what the inside cover says. Mia Tang has a lot of secrets. Number one, she lives in a motel, not a big house. Every day while her immigrant parents clean the rooms, 10-year-old Mia manages the front desk of the Calvista Motel and tends to its guests. Number two, her parents hide immigrants. And if the mean motel owner, Mr. Yao, finds out they've been letting them stay in the empty rooms for free, the Tangs will be doomed. Number three, she wants to be a writer. But how can she when her mom thinks she should stick to math because English is not her first language? It will take all of Mia's courage, kindness, and hard work to get through this year. While she was able to hold on to her job, help the immigrants and guests, and escape Mr. Yao, and go for her dreams? Hmm. All right, so let's get started. And I even like how with the cover on the inside, it has all kinds of fun things related to being in a hotel or motel like a calendar and when the checkout is at 11 a.m., how an ID is required, no late checkouts. So I always like it when they set the scene before we start reading. And real quick a reminder, we always want reading to be an enjoyable experience. So I do have my snuggly blanket. I have something to drink off to the side and I also have a really snuggly kitty while we're reading. Chapter one. My parents told me that America would be this amazing place where we could live in a house with a dog, do whatever we want, and eat hamburgers till we were red in the face. So far, the only part of what we've achieved is the hamburger part. But I was still holding out hope, and the hamburgers here are pretty good. The most incredible burger I've ever had was at the Houston Space Center last summer. We weren't planning on eating there. Everybody knows museum food is 50,000 times more expensive than outside food. But one whiff of this of sizzling bacon as we passed by the cafe and my knees wobbled. My parents must have heard the howls of my stomach because the next thing I knew, my mother was rummaging through her purse for coins. We only had enough money for one hamburger. So we had to share, but man, what a burger. It was a mile high with real bacon and mayonnaise and pickles. My mom likes to tease that I devoured the whole thing in one gulp, leaving the two of them only a couple of crumbs. I'd like to think I gave them more than that. The other thing that was great about that space center was the free air conditioning. We were living in our car that summer, which sounds like a lot of fun, but actually wasn't. Because our car's AC was busted. So after the burger, my dad parked himself in front of the vent and stayed there for the entire rest of the time. It was like he was trying to turn his fingers into popsicles. My mom and I bounced from exhibit to exhibit instead. I could barely keep up with her. She was an engineer back in China, so she loves math and rockets. She oohed and awed over this module and that module. I wished my cousin Shen could have been there. He loves rockets too. When we got to the photo booth, my mother's face lit up. The booth took a picture of you and made it look like you were a real astronaut in space. I went first. I put my head where the cardboard cutout was and smiled when the guy said, cheese. 
when it was my mom's turn to take her photo, I thought it would be funny to jump into her shot. The result was a picture of her in an astronaut suit hovering over Earth and me standing right next to her in my flip-flops, doing bunny ears with my fingers. My mother's face crumpled when she saw her picture. She placed with the guy, she pleaded with the guy to let her take another one, but he said, no can do, one picture per person. For a second, I thought she was going to cry. We still have the picture. Every time I look at it, I wish I could go back in time. If I could do it all over again, I would not photobomb my mom's picture and I'd give her more of my burger. Not the whole thing, but definitely some more bites. At the end of that summer, my dad got a job as an assistant fryer at a Chinese restaurant in California. That meant that we didn't have to live in our car anymore and we could move into a small, side, a small one bedroom apartment. It also meant my dad brought home fried rice from work every day. But sometimes he'd also bring back big old blisters all up and down his arms. They said they were just allergies, but I don't think so. I think he got him, them from frying food all day long in the sizzling walk. My mom got a job in the front of the restaurant as a waitress. Everybody liked her and she got great tips. She even managed to convince the boss to let me go with her to the restaurant after school since there was nobody to look after me. My mother's boss was a wrinkly white haired Chinese man who reeked of garlic and didn't believe in wasting anything. Not cooking oil, not toilet paper, and certainly not free labor. You think you can handle waitressing, kid? He asked me. Yes, sir, I said. Excitement pulsated in my ears. My first job? I was determined not to let him down. There was just only one problem. I was only nine and needed two hands just to hold one dish steady. The other waitresses managed five plates at a time. Some didn't even need hands. They could balance a plate on their shoulder. When the dinner rush came, I too loaded up my carry-in tray with five dishes. Big mistake. As my small back gave into the mountainous weight, all my dishes came crashing down. Hot soup splashed onto customers and fried prawns went flying across the restaurant. I was fired on the spot and so was my mother. No amount of begging or promising to do the dishes for the next gazillion years would change the owner's mind. The whole way home, I fought tears in my eyes. I thought of my three cousins back home. None of them had ever gotten fired before. Like me, they were only children as well. In China, every child is an only child. Ever since the government decided all families were allowed, only one. Since none of us had siblings, we were our siblings. Leaving them was the hardest part about leaving China. I didn't want my mom to see me cry in the car, but eventually that night she heard me. She came into my room and sat down on my bed. Hey, it's okay, she said in Chinese, hugging me tight. It's not your fault. She wiped a tear from my cheek. Through the thin walls, I could hear the sounds of the husbands and wives bickering and babies wailing from our other neighbors' apartments. Each one was as cramped as ours. Mom, I asked her, why did we come here? Why did we come to America, I repeated. My mother looked away and didn't say anything for a long time. A plane flew overhead and the picture frames on the wall shook. She looked in my eyes because it's freer here, she finally said which didn't make any sense. Nothing was free in America. Everything was so expensive. But mom, one day you'll understand, she said, kissing the top of my head. Now go to sleep. I drifted to sleep thinking about my cousins and missing them and hoping they were missing me back. So sorry, Luna's over to the side here and she's playing with a toy and making some noise. Luna, come here. Luna. I don't think she wants to pay attention to me. Hey, can you stop? Come here. After my mother got fired from the restaurant, she got very serious about job hunting. She called it getting back on her horse. It was 1993 and she bought every Chinese newspaper she could find. She poured over the job section with a magnifying glass like a scientist. That's when she came across an unusual thing, an unusual listing. A man named Michael Ya had put an ad in the Chinese newspaper looking for an experienced motel manager. The ad said that he owned a little motel in Anaheim, California, and he was looking for someone to run the place. The job came with free boarding too. 
My mother jumped up and grabbed the phone. Our rent then cost almost all of my dad's salary. And who said things in America were free? Well, hello, Luna. To her surprise, Mr. Yao was equally enthusiastic. He didn't seem to mind that my parents weren't experienced and really liked the fact that they were a couple. Two for the price of one, he joked in his thick Taiwanese accented Mandarin when he went over to his house the next day. When we went over to his house the next day, my parents smiled nervously while I tried to stay as still as I could and not screw it up for them. Uh, like I'd screwed up my mother's restaurant job. We were sitting in the living room of Mr. Yao's house, or rather his mansion. I made myself look at the floor and not stare at the top of Mr. Yao's head, which was all shiny under the light, like it had been painted in egg white. The door opened and a boy about my age walked in. He had on a t-shirt that said, I don't give a, and underneath it, a picture of a rat and a donkey. I raised an eyebrow. Jason, Mr. Yao said to the boy, say hello. Hi, Jason muttered. My parents smiled at Jason. What grade are you in? They asked him in Chinese. I think Luna's gonna join us for a while. Jason replied in English, I'm going to fifth grade. Ah, oh, same as Mia, my mom said. She smiled at Mr. Yao. Your son's English is so good. She turned to me, hear that Mia? No accent. My cheeks burned. I felt my tongue in my mouth like a limp lizard. Of course he speaks good English. He was born here. Mr. Yao said he speaks native English. Native, I mouthed the word. I wondered if I worked really hard, would I also be able to speak in native English one day? Or was that something completely off limits for me? I looked over at my mom who was shaking her head. Jason disappeared off into his room and Mr. Yao asked my parents if they had any questions. Just to make sure we can live at the motel for free, my mom asked. Yes, said Mr. Yao. And what about, my mom struggled to get the words out. She shook her head in Paris to say it. Will we get paid? All oh, right, payment, said Mr. Yao, like it hadn't even dawned on him at all. How's $5 a customer? I glanced at my mom. I could tell she was doing math in her head, but she always got this dreamy smile on her face. 30 rooms at $5 a room, that's $150 a night, my mom said, her eyes widening. She looked at my dad, that's a lot of money. It was a humongous amount of money. We could buy hamburgers every day, one for each of us we wouldn't even need to share. When can you start, Mr. Yao asked. Tomorrow, my mom and dad blurted out at the exact same time. Mr. Yao laughed. As my parents got, to shake, got up to shake his hands, Mr. Yao muttered, I have to warn you, it's not the nicest motel in the world. My parents nodded. I could tell it made no difference to them what the motel looked like. It could look like the inside of a Greyhound bus toilet all, for all we cared, $150 a day plus free rent, we were in. Trying to turn pages with a cat on your lap, it's a little difficult. Chapter two. The Calvista Motel sat on the corner of Coast Boulevard and Meadow Lane. It was a small motel, the first of three motels in a row. The Topaz Inn and the Lagoon Motel were right next door and bigger, but I immediately decided I liked our little motel the best. With its creamy walls and red doors, it looked like warm and inviting. I looked up at the sign and read the words, low rates, cable TV, Disneyland, just five miles away. Excitedly, I asked my parents if it meant we could go and visit all of the rides. We probably could, my mom said. I smiled, savoring the moment. Our lives were about to change. We were going to become Disneyland going people. As if things couldn't get any better, the Calvista had a pool. It was right out in front. The water sparkled under the golden sun. I closed my eyes and pictured myself doing cannonballs in the water all summer long. This was going to be amazing. Just behind the pool was the front office. I'd asked my parents in the car whether I could help out at the front desk and my mom had chuckled and said, my dad had chuckled and said, we'll see. Mr. Yao was waiting for us in the front office. He buzzed us in and lifted the divider so we could all get behind the front desk. The front desk was a long wooden desk that stretched almost the entire width of the room. Just behind the front office was the manager's quarters where Mr. Yao led us next. 
There was a living room with a bed in it. He pointed to the bed. You guys sleep there, he said to my parents, so you can hear the customers in the middle of the night. Customers come in the middle of the night, my dad asked. Mr. Yao nodded. Of course, it's a motel. But won't that wake them up, I asked. Mr. Yao rolled his eyes. That's the point, he said. Next, he led us over to the small bedroom just to the right of the living room and the kitchen. The girl can sleep here, Mr. Yao said. For some reason, he still kept calling me the girl, even though I had already told him my name several times. I put my stuff down in the small bedroom, then joined my parents and Mr. Yao in the front office. Mr. Yao was explaining the buzzer. One wrong buzz and it's all over, he said. See that glass? He pointed to the thick glass enclosing the front office. That's bulletproof glass. You see a bad guy come up, you don't need to worry. They can't hear, hurt you if you press this buzzer. He put his finger on the buzzer just under the front desk and a loud buzz roared. That door right there gets unlocked, Mr. Yao said. And then what, I asked him. Then he's inside, Mr. Yao said. I looked around to see if it were any other magical buttons or bulletproof glass inside the office. There weren't. I asked Mr. Yao how we could tell if someone was a bad guy. Based on how they looked, of course, he said, which made me wonder because it's not like bad people walked around with a sticker on their head saying, I'm bad. The bottom line is, don't let in any bad guys, Mr. Yao warned. His pupils expanded as he said the word bad. While well, Mr. Yao took my parents out back to show them the laundry room, laundry room and cleaning supplies, I stayed in the front office. I climbed up on top of the front desk school. Gently, I reached down and touched the buzzer with my finger. It was greasy, like it had been pressed hundreds of times. Slowly, I pressed on it and heard it zap. I pressed it again. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Power coursed through my fingertips. I closed my eyes and pictured myself checking customers in. Why, yes, Mrs. Connolly, I'd be glad to show you to your room. Right this way, I'd say. Certainly, I can help you with your luggage. It would be my pleasure. So deep was I in my fake customer relations that I almost didn't hear it when a real customer walked up and tapped on the front office glass. I looked up to see a thin African-American man, about 50 years old or so, smiling and waving at me. He motioned with his right hand to buzz me to with for me to buzz him in. Oh, right, I said, and then I pressed on the buzzer. Buzz. He opened the door and walked in. Just saw Mr. Yao in the lot. You must be the new managers, he said. He extended his hand across the front desk. Name's Hank. I smiled and shook his hand. I'm Mia, nice to meet you. He tilted his head to one side. How old are you, Mia? I'm 10, I told him. Say, aren't you a little long, young to be running this place, he teased me. I laughed. I liked Hank immediately. I'm helping my parents, I told him. What about you? Do you live here? Sure do, he said, pointing to one of the rooms. That's me right there, number 12. Hank informed me that he wasn't a regular customer, the kind who stays just a day or two. He was a weekly. A weekly is someone who pays by the week. There were five of them at the Cal Vista. There was Mrs. Q, Mrs. T, Hank, Billy Bob, and Fred. You'll meet them, he said. They're all nice people. I smiled. Do you guys like living here, I asked. Oh, yeah. Well, except for Mr. Yao. Everyone hates Mr. Yao. Really, I said. He seems all right. Intense, but all right. Hank snorted. Huh, trust me, he's anything but all right. Before I could ask Hank what he meant by that, the back door creaked open and my parents and Mr. Yao came back in. When I turned around, Hank was gone. All right, so that's the end of chapter two. So we're going to stop there. So if you are interested in continuing this book, this um, you would want to start with chapter three. And this book is, um, like I said, one that I have heard about on a lot of recommended reading lists, uh, a lot of festive, you know, books for that year reading lists. Um, it's definitely one that is highly, highly re recommended. Okay, so we are going to pause there and the Plinko board is back. So we're going to be dropping our Plinko trip to chip to find out what we're going to be reading next time. So hold on just one moment. Hi, we are back and ready to do our Polinko board. Now, I am so sorry. You can probably see the reflection here of my light as I'm filming. So sorry about that. 
Um, now I did change the order of our uh, different genres that we have to choose from down here at the bottom. So we have fantasy, humor, historical fiction, I have adventure, and previously this was Miss Jessica's choice, but technically they're all Miss Jessica's choice. So we have science fiction. Now I do have adventure a second time because adventure books are always super exciting and actually some of my favorites. So why not have that as one that comes up a little more often? Realistic fiction, mystery, and spooky. Now we also have Luna right here all snuggled up. And I do have a couple of Plinko chips to drop just in case. And there she goes. Um, just in case because these do like to fly off or in case we get something we've just had recently. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is that this book, we do have an e-audiobook version of this on Libby by Overdrive. Um, if you want to download the app, you can listen to this as an e-audiobook. We also have it as an audiobook, which is where you can check it out and listen to it as a CD. So we've got a couple of different ways for you to listen to it if you are interested in continuing reading that way. All right, so here we go. And these do like to fall off, so I'm going to tilt this back a little bit. Ooh, realistic fiction. I don't think we have had that one recently. So next time we are together, we will be reading a realistic fiction book. All right. So thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget, we do have our chapter book story time every Wednesday. Um, it is going between myself and a few other people. So I will see you um, maybe next week or maybe in a couple of weeks. And hopefully you'll still keep tuning in to find some really, really fun things to read. Again, thanks for joining us. I'm Miss Jessica from EVPL Oakland, and I'll see you again soon. Bye!